Okay, uh, let's start. For those attending online, I'll put the link to the worksheet in the chat. Okay. Alright. Uh, so just a quick introduction of who we are and what we are. Basically, Overmark is a team of specialist tutors. Right? So we all teach about one or two subjects at most. Right? Then we most of us have at least three to five, five to thirteen years of teaching experience. So our current branches are at Bukit Timah, Parkway and Serangoon. We are also exploring other spaces at Topayo, Jurong East, Woodlands, and in next year, Tampanese. Okay. So just quick self-introduction. Yeah, my name is Shannon. I graduated from NTU with chemistry degree, so I'm teaching chemistry. Uh yeah, I taught for about seven years. Uh in set two, I was actually ranked top 10 in Asia for one of the computer games. So last time you Google my name, you can find me there. But the game closed down, so you can't find me anymore. Okay. Uh what we're covering today is basically just a quick overview of the uh, past topics one to six mainly. Right, because those are taught in the earlier years, we may have forgotten some stuff. And I'll be focusing on commonly tested questions. I think that's the main objective today. All right, these questions you all confirm see before. Okay. Unfortunately, I'll only be covering like these five uh, topics. Why? Because from this, after chemical bonding, usually schools teach different topics. Right, then I can't cater to everyone. That is one. And in the set three syllabus, uh, there's a new way of teaching writing chemical formula. So I don't want to go to that extent because I know there are set fours joining us. Yeah, so to prevent confusion, I'll just be focusing on this five. Okay. Right. So hopefully these two hours will be productive for you. Then let's begin. Any questions, just raise your hand and ask or you can type in the chat. Then I will address. Okay, let's go. Okay, the first topic initially was... Oops. Okay. okay, so you realize my watch is a little bit different from other teachers because notes wise, I believe you all can read. If I were to just read notes off the slide or in class, you all will probably fall asleep. Right, so I'll be recalling or reviewing concepts as we go through the questions. Okay, these are commonly tested questions that you will expect to see. Okay, so starting with experimental chemistry, gas collection and separation and drying of gases first. Okay, so I got these two methods of gas collection. The first one on the left is called upward delivery. Okay. You use upward delivery to collect gases. Okay, less dense than air. How do you know if something is less dense than air? The MR is less than 29. Okay, then now some students will ask what is MR? MR refers to relative molecular mass. If you cover more, you will know what is that. If not for now, okay. most of you have learned mass number, right? So for example, NH3, ammonia gas. This consists of one nitrogen atom and three hydrogen atoms. So how do you calculate the MR of this? If you refer to the periodic table, your N will be 14, 7, H will be 1, 1. Okay, so we will take the mass number and calculate the total mass of this. So the total mass of ammonia gas will be 14 plus 3, giving you 17. So that's how you calculate MR. Okay, and since ammonia gas is less than 29, in terms of the MR, it is less dense. Right? If something is less dense, it will float. So this is why upward delivery is like going upwards. And on the other hand, you have the downward delivery, which looks like this. Why? Because if something is less, if something is denser, sorry, it will sink. Right, then that's when we use downward delivery for this. So gas collection, only three types. Upward and downward depends on the MR, density of gas. Okay, this is the MR of air, okay? More or less. Question so far? Okay. Then now we look at the one on the right. This is called displacement of water. This is to collect insoluble gases, insoluble, partially soluble gases. If you want to memorize, by all means, there's only three you need to know, uh, H2, O2, uh, CO2. Okay, hydrogen gas, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide gas. OK, 
Okay, so for MCQ questions, let's say in exam, you forget one, how, then you use elimination to solve law. So let's say you know the one on the right. This is for insoluble or partially soluble gases, right? So you realize that this part is correct already. That's why it's for insoluble in water. Okay, this part is also correct. This part is also correct. Okay, gas X is less dense. So therefore, the answer will be C. Okay, unfortunately, if you eliminate from the right side, you will still have three answers. You only cancel out one wrong option. But if you immediately recognize that gas X is less dense than air, that's why we use upward delivery, you can actually get the answer straight away. Because there are no other options with that. Okay, then something a little bit more complicated. Now you have collection of gas and drying of gas. Okay, drying of gas simply means removing moisture. Which is like H2O lah, basically, removing water vapor. Okay, so that you get a purer sample of the gas. That's the objective. So let's say you have a mixture of gases that pass through this setup. You need to recognize that this is a drying agent. This is the chemical substance that will remove moisture of H2O. Okay, then most of you, okay, actually not say most. All right, by elimination, same thing again. This is for gases that are less dense than air, MR less than 29. Okay, if you refer to your periodic table, argon will be 40, neon will be 20, sulfur dioxide is SO2, so this will be 32 plus 2 times 16, which is 64. Okay, and ammonia is just now we calculated 14 plus 3, 17. Okay, so there's only two possible options that are less dense than A. It's either B or D. Okay, what is commonly tested over here is that if you have sulfuric acid as a drying agent, you cannot collect ammonia gas. Why? Because it will react. If you react, how can you get back your ammonia gas? There shouldn't be any reaction. Okay, so what's commonly tested over here is ammonia will react with sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid is not suitable as a drying agent. If it comes out of open ender, okay? So therefore, final answer will be neon. Neon is actually a noble gas. We should probably learn that it's unreactive. Okay, just more variations of it. Okay, gas W, as you can see, they like to test ammonia. Okay, MR17 is actually ammonia, but they don't tell you. They say it's alkaline in nature and soluble in water. Okay, which method is used to collect a dry sample of gas W? So you know it's less dense than air, you need either C or D, upward delivery. And same thing tested over here. You want to collect ammonia gas, cannot use acid as a drying agent. So answer will be C. Okay, so you can see quite repetitive, I just how they phrase the question. Okay, then I think last one over here. The different types of apparatus. Okay, your conical flask is not for measurement, it's just to contain your liquid or solution. Okay, measuring cylinder is for volume estimation. It's not accurate, okay? Approximation estimation. Sometimes you may see keywords like this. Okay, as you can see over here. Approximately. So this is R and R. Okay, beaker and measuring cylinder, they are not accurate. And then your pipette comes in fixed sizes. If you all seen a pipette in your lab before, there's only one marking at the top over here. It can only measure one volume. Okay, so exactly 25.0 will be pipette. And then your burette will be the most accurate. You can measure up to 1 dp or even 2 dp. Okay, so answer will be this.
make sure you know how to spell open ended they can ask you name the most suitable apparatus this is viewed and this is pipette okay i'll write over here like since it's keywords need to spell correctly for one mark Okay, then now we go to the second part, separation techniques. So these separation techniques, they are physical methods. Okay, when do you use physical methods to separate components in a mixture? Yeah, let's go through a brief overview first. Huh? So what are some physical methods that you all learn or are expected to know? You have your filtration. You have your distillation, which is simple or fractional. You have crystallization, evaporation to dryness. All these are physical methods. Crystallization. Evaporate to dryness. Okay, let's start with the simplest form of mixture. Imagine a mixture of sand and water. Right? The sand will just settle at the bottom, the water will be at the top. They don't mix, there's no chemical bonds between that. Right? They are just physically combined. That's what a mixture essentially is. Now how do you separate the sand from the water? You simply carry out filtration, right? And after you do filtration, your sand is collected as the residue, while your water is collected as the filtrate, right? After filtration, is there any new substance form or not? There isn't, it's still water and sand. Right, so this is the key thing about physical methods. After performing any of these physical methods, no new chemical substance is formed. Okay, you are just separating the things inside a mixture. That's how you may... I think crystallization is a bit harder to visualize, so I'll do crystallization. Okay, you are not copying this down, right? Yeah, don't need that. Just understand here already. So for crystallization, crystallization is often used to get the dissolved solid back. Okay, so for example, let's say you have sodium chloride salt at room temperature and solid state, right? If you throw inside water, what's going to happen? It's going to dissolve. That's where we say it becomes aqueous state. Aqueous state means dissolve in water. Now, how can you get back the sodium chloride crystals? You perform crystallization if you have a choice. No choice then evaporate to dryness. Okay, crystallization has lesser limit limitations. It's much better. Then you will get your Sodium chloride crystals back. So essentially, crystallization helps you reverse the process of dissolving something. Okay. At this point, is there any new thing formed or not? No. It's still sodium chloride, right? So hopefully you can see that crystallization is a physical process. No new chemical substance is formed. Okay, you are essentially just separating the sodium chloride crystals from the water. Okay. So that's just a quick summary for our separation techniques. And then we have purity. In chemistry, how to test for purity simply measure melting point, boiling point. If the substance is pure, it will have a fixed melting point, boiling point. Okay, if the substance is impure, melting point, boiling point occurs over a range of temperature. Right? I think we'll look at that later. Okay, so let's start with question one. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius, melting point of sodium chloride is 801 degrees Celsius. Which of the following is most likely to be the boiling point of sea water? Okay, key thing over here is that melting point okay, impurities are melting point decrease, boiling point will increase. And by right, it will occur over a range of temperature. So pure water maybe will have a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius, but your sea water 
maybe 101 to 102 because it's impure, there's salt inside. When I say something is impure, means there are multiple substances. There's a salt, there's a sand, there's a water mixture. Okay. And hopefully using logic, majority of the substance over here is still water. So you should be choosing something that is close to water. Okay, and over here, boiling point will increase due to the presence of impurities. So answer will be B. Salt is just a minor component over here. Majority of it is still water. Alright, question two, I think you all can try yourself. How to test for purity? Few sentences. And how does chromatography work? You all know? Few seconds also. Yeah, we kept chromatography later. There's one entire question for it and distillation as well. I mean, those two are the most commonly tested and open ended. Okay. Right, so just now I mentioned, you just measure melting point, boiling point for chemistry. And why does separation of spots occur in paper chromatography? Why do you see something like this? It's because of different solubility. If the substances have different solubility, they interact with the solvent at different rates. Means they will travel up at different speed. If they travel up at different speed, that's where the separation occurs. Okay. Right, then this is probably one of the harder ones. How can you separate two solids? Okay, usually the first step is that you need to dissolve one of it first. So you have sodium chloride, which is your NaCl, and sand. Okay, what you do is you add water first. Okay, after you add water, this is your mixture. What are you going to get? You're going to get sand in the solid state. It doesn't dissolve. It's insoluble. Okay, and you are going to get NaCl equal state. It's going to dissolve. Okay, now you have a solid liquid mixture. You can perform filtration. Okay, then your sand will be collected as residue. Okay, then your NaCl will be collected as filtrate. Okay, then how do you get back your sodium chloride crystals? You just crystallize back. Okay, so dissolve first by adding water. Then you filter off the sand. Then you evaporate your heat fuel saturated and then you crystallize. So B. Okay, you are starting with two solids. How can you start with filtration? It doesn't make sense. So C and B is out. I mean you have crystals, so they expect you to know it's a solid. Lah. Sometimes they can change the water to like ethanol or something, doesn't matter, okay? The top process is very similar. Okay, then now we come to the paper chromatography. State the dyes that can be found in your ink. So what do you do in the exam? You just check the alignment. Okay, hopefully you can see dye 2 and dye 4. Hello. Uh, yeah, correct. Okay. That was space. Oh. This one is at page four. Okay. 
Now we're at page 4. Okay, state another conclusion that you can make about the ink. Explain your answer. One mark for stating, one mark for explanation. What else can you deduce about the ink? What does multiple spots mean? The substance is... You know? Yeah, I saw that word, impure. Okay. Uh, two possible answers here. The substance is a mixture or impure. Both accepted. Okay, how do you know? The Okay. The ink consists of multiple spots. Okay, if you see only one spot, then means that substance is pure. If you see multiple spots, then it's impure or it's a mixture. Okay, on the chromatogram circle, the component of the ink that is the most soluble. As mentioned just now, if something is more soluble, travel further distance. Right, so it's the one that moves up the highest. This. It is the most soluble, huh? for the travel for the furthest from the starting line. Sometimes they may also ask, why is the spot found here? And you just explain because it's insoluble in the solvent. One mark. Oh, okay. That's explanation there, is it? The more soluble a substance is, the further it will travel from the starting line. You can explain why the starting line should be drawn with pencil instead of pen ink. You can explain from either point of view, either the pen or pencil, but pen ink will be easier. If pen ink is soluble in water, and go. Okay. In this case, it's. Oh yeah, that's right. So it means our starting line will disappear. If something is soluble, it means it will dissolve. Okay, and just take note, not every time the solvent is water. If they say ethanol, it will change. Huh? Alternatively, you can say pencil lead is insoluble and will not dissolve. Okay, and distillation. Okay. okay, name the method of separation above. This is simple distillation. Okay, question is meant to use what? Simple distillation usually we use for seawater or salt water. Okay. Then you have fractional distillation, right? Fractional distillation is used when you have a mixture of liquids, like two or three different kinds of liquids. Then you use fractional distillation. So just now for metagraphy, how does it work is due to difference in solubility. How does separation in distillation work? It's due to difference in boiling point. Because they have different boiling points, they come out at different timing. Right, they will boil at different timing and then they will condense at different timing. Then I'll move up so you can see. 
Okay, then state the reading on the thermometer when the first drop of distillate is collected. What is this distillate going to be? It's going to be your water. After this distillation, right, your salt is left over here. You're going to see your white crystals or residue and pure water is going to be collected here. Right? So when the first drop of distillate comes out, what is the temperature that's registered by the thermometer? It's actually 100 degrees Celsius because water vapor is coming out. Right, water vapor is coming out, getting condensed, and then that's how you collect the pure water. So answer for that is just 100 degrees Celsius. Okay. The role of the thermometer is to measure the boiling point of the vapor that's coming out. So you know what's coming out. Because like fractional distillation, you may have different liquids, right? So how do you know which liquid is coming out? Right? You check the thermometer for the boiling point. No? Okay. Label the direction of water entering and leaving the condenser. Can you remember this? Okay, water in is below, uh. water out is at the top. So they can ask you to draw like this, or they can ask you what's wrong with the distillation setup, and then give you the wrong one. Okay, last one, state the purpose of the condenser. Okay, as the name suggests, condenser is supposed to help things condense, but you need to say all these keywords. Provide a cool surface for the hot vapor to condense. Into Any questions for our first chapter? Anything to clarify? Any question? Okay. Right, let's go to the second chapter, kinetic particle theory. Oh. Answer key uploaded on Friday. Okay. A sample of pure compound is heated until it is completely molten and the compound is then allowed to cool until it is completely solid again. Okay, kinetic particle theory basically is testing on solid liquid gases on those things. Okay, whenever you have a temperature graph, try to understand the context. So they heat this solid until it becomes molten means liquid and then the, this compound is allowed to cool until it becomes solid again. So why do you need to understand the context, right? It's whenever you have this temperature graph, what I highly recommend is you assign the state, even for physics. Okay, same thing tested here. Huh? This is your liquid. This is your liquid and solid. And then this will be your solid. Okay, after that it's much easier already. Then now you may ask, why during a state change there is two states? For example, when the ice is melting, you will see both the solid and liquid, right? So during a state change, you will actually see two states. Okay. When water is boiling, you will see the steam and the water, both water and gas. Yep. Okay, so answer for this will just be Q to R. Okay. Because after you write all this. Okay, because after you write all this, right, sometimes they'll ask you, describe the arrangement and movement of the particles at region P to Q. Something like this. Right, but now that you've written decrease state over here is much easier. Okay. You know what keywords to write already. Okay. Okay, here there's a slight difference in set 3 and set 4 syllabus. Take note that set 3 and set 4 syllabus, the periodic table is different. Okay, I'm gonna show you the difference. Okay, open it. Yeah. Then yeah, I close it, this one.
Okay, for the set trees, okay, the arrangement is all the same. The only difference is the top numbers. Okay, I think they cannot see. Okay, for set trees, you all need to use these numbers already. For set fours, you all will see the Roman numerals, which is this. Okay. Okay, so hopefully you can see the difference. Huh? So set fours, you all stay to these Roman numerals. Set trees, you all use the 1 to 17. So sometimes uh, you may see school questions forget to change because this syllabus is like the first year for the set trees. So sometimes your school may forget to change the Roman numerals away. So just take note, okay? Alright. So group 17 is your group VII essentially. Right, above iodine. Bromine has a melting point of negative 7.2 and boiling point of 58.8. For this kind of question, what you do, you simply just draw a number line. Okay, melting point, boiling point. It's just like a normal math number line, okay? Then your melting point is negative 7.2. Your boiling point is 58.8. Okay, then you ask yourself, what's the temperature that they want? 25. Where is 25 on this number line? It should be in the center. Hopefully, you all can visualize on this normal math number line. Just like getting more negative ready. Just getting more positive. Okay? So since it's in between, nothing point and boiling point, it will be liquid. Okay, then draw the arrangement of bromine particles at temperature negative 4 degrees Celsius and 60 degrees Celsius. So same thing, where's negative 4 on this number line? It's here. Okay, so you need to draw for a liquid state. La. So for drawing on these diagrams, what I recommend is you draw a little bit bigger. You need to fill up three quarters of the space. So if you draw bigger, it means you got lesser to draw. For liquid particles, make sure that it's still disorder arrangement, but they are touching each other. Fine. For gas simple, just draw 3 is enough. Oh, I just gave the answer. Okay, 60 is over here. So this is gas. La. It is your 60. La. Questions for chapter 2? Okay. okay, I'll be skipping to 5 first since uh, most schools actually follow the old order. Structure and properties of materials. Now, school notes will be elements, compound, and mixture. Okay. Mm. Let me just quick overview first. Key thing to understand from this chapter is the difference between elements and compounds. So there's three ways that they can test. First is visually. How do elements look like? Maybe something like this. How do compounds look like? Something like this. Okay, so what can you see? Elements consist of one type of atom only but your compound consists of two or more types. Okay, so this is the visual diagram that you can test. Another way that you can test is through chemical formula. For example, for example Cl2, right, only one type of atom, so this is considered an element. Okay, then this one maybe is Cl. You can see two different elements inside, so this is a compound. Okay, then the third way they can test is they give you certain information. They say that this substance cannot be broken down further by heat. Right, something like this. Or this substance uh, will form a gas and a solid 
right? Under strong heating, something like this. This can be broken down. Okay, so I give you certain information you need to use whether it's an element, compound, or a mixture. Just now we also covered fixed melting point and boiling point, right? Those refer to your element and compound. Element and compounds are pure substances. They have fixed melting point and boiling point. Only mixtures are impure. That's when you have, or that's when you don't have a fixed melting point and boiling point. Okay, so let's look at the three types of questions. Which of the substance below is a compound? And then I'll try. Compound, huh? Compound. Okay. Yeah. Oh, let's got it. Answer will be S. Okay. You can see that this thing consists of two different types of atoms. This is the same type of atom, so this is considered element. Okay, then what are P and R? P and R they are mixtures. Mixtures have two or more types of substance inside. You have one element inside here, you have one compound inside here. So P is said to be a mixture of element and compound. Okay, what about R? In R, you will see two different elements. So R is a mixture of elements. Okay. So that's why the key is to differentiate between elements and compounds first. Make sure it's more of an overview. Do you see two or more substances inside or not? Yep, answer is S. Huh? Oh, yeah, compound. Okay, then two. The diagram represents different substances which will correctly describe the substances. substances. Okay. Each of these is called an atom. Atom is like your single Lego block. Okay. Then each of these is called a molecule. Molecule means got multiple atoms joined together, chemically combined. All right. So it's either like singular or plural, like basically. So this is atom. This is atom. This is a molecule. This is an atom. Okay, so on so forth. Huh? I think you can tell already. So we don't care what type of atoms does it consist of. In this case, we just consider the quantity. Atom is one, molecule is two or more combined together. Right? Which one only have separate atoms? Uh, P have, T also has atoms. What about only molecules? I see Q only. Right, because your R and S got atoms inside. Mixture of atoms and molecules that will be R and S. So the answer will be A. Okay, then this is the chemical formula one. Number of elements, number of atoms. Okay, I'll try. How many building blocks do you need to build this? That's the number of atoms. Okay. Elements is how many capital letters do you see? So you see one, two, three, four. Right. How many like ball do you need to build this thing? You will need you will need one NA, one H, one C, so total here three already. And you need three oxygen, so six. So just count on it. Lah. Okay, and next, yeah, this is the information one. I have some substance PQRS. Which classification of the substances is correct? Percentage composition by mass, if it varies, that's a hint that it's a mixture. Make sure you can mix any proportion. Right, it doesn't matter. But let's say for compounds like water, the proportion is fixed. You need two hydrogen and one oxygen to make water. Okay. But elements also fix lah. But all we know is P and S, they are a mixture. Okay, so let's see if we have any answer so far. Okay, we have two. 
Solid conducts electricity. Do you know what solid conducts electricity? I don't know. What are good conductors of electricity? Yeah, metals. Okay. But not very helpful over here. Lah. Okay. Changes on heating. Okay. Solid melt. Okay, let's start on P. Ah. Liquid burns to form carbon dioxide and water. Right, y'all will be like, what is this? Don't know, right? Okay, then skip first. Lah. Okay, solid burns in air to form an oxide. When they say burn, right, it kind of means react with oxygen. Lah. Okay? So y'all may be like, huh? I also don't know what this. Okay, but then solid decomposes. What does that tell you? It is broken down by heat. Right? Means it's not in the simplest form yet. R must be a compound. Okay? Compounds can be broken down by chemical means into simpler substances. Elements is the simplest form and you cannot break it down further. Okay, then S is just simply change state. Lah. Yeah, so the key thing is over here and all this. Yeah. Then if you all want to write this now, burn in air means react with oxygen. Lah. I will see you again next time. Okay, so I'll give you all some time to try. Just open ended, write one letter, one mark, very worth it. We all can try A and B, or the short answer one. Phrasing one, we can go through together. choosing the letters. Let's go through. Uh. Okay, what do you all know about copper? Copper is a metal, it exists as a solid. Right? So which one looks like a solid and which one is an element? It will be A. Right? Solid state particles are closely packed right? in regular arrangement. Then methane, CH4. Try to make sense out of it. Which one looks like a CH4 to you? Got 1C and 4H. It is this one over here. See? Let me take CH4. And then next. Mixture of noble gases. Noble gases are a bit special. They exist as individual atoms like this. So try to recognize that. Huh? It's not linked with other topics also. Why do they exist as individual atoms? Or you may see the word monatomic. It's because they are unreactive. Later we will cover why 
Yeah, yeah, I'm active. Okay, but just note that because they are unreactive, they exist alone. Okay, so answer will be B. Okay, then alloy. Alloy is an example of a mixture. Mixtures don't really have a chemical formula. So some examples of mixtures that you need to know. I'll just write at the top. Air. Uh, you all see the seawater already, all those are mixture and alloys. Alloys is a mixture of a metal and one or more other elements. For example, steel, you may see this as well, and brass. You all see this too in your TOS. It's a mixture of a metal and another element. The other element can be metal or non metal, it doesn't matter. So alloys will look something like this. And you're still in brass, they are still solid, right? So it's a mixture. Okay, then which of the above substances have a fixed melting point and boiling point? Hmm? The note did it? Oh, does this can be or can buy you? Okay, uh, I take for you in a bit. After this, we take five minutes break. Okay. okay, which of the above substances have a fixed melting point and boiling point? In other words, they are asking which is a pure substance, which is your element or compound. Okay, so which is an element or compound? Answer will be A and C. Element and compounds have fixed melting point and boiling point. Your B, D, E, and F, they are mixtures. You can see two or more different types of substance inside. Okay, so A and C. Right, then describe two differences between a compound and a mixture. Uh, let's do table form. I'll just give you all three, okay? I mean, there's like five, but we need to memorize all. I'll just go through the two most common ones. Okay. Components can be separated by chemical methods. Okay, then what about your mixtures? That's how we learn about physical methods, right? Components can be separated by physical methods. Okay, then the other one, also learned already just now. Fix, nothing point. And what you call. Pure substance, ma. Okay, the other one, melting point. Okay, you can just write short form, lah. MP, EP, occur over a range of temperature. Exam, you all write the full thing. Okay, so this two is the most commonly used one. You may see this the soap. Uh, fixed proportion by mass. Like as I mentioned, to make water just now, you need two hydrogen, one oxygen. Does not have a fixed proportion by mass. Yes, energy change also can. It's just that these two seems a bit more intuitive to memorize. Because you will see this being tested repeatedly. repeatedly. Yep. Okay, now maybe we take five minutes break, then we come back at two. Eight. I'm in a chat also.
Okay, we'll wait a while more. Some people are at the toilet. Okay, uh, we left with two important topics, atomic structure and chemical bonding. Okay, just a uh, quick feedback first. Do you want me to talk lesser? Do you want to try doing or do you want me to teach? Any preference? If it's okay, just continue, just thumbs up. Yeah, I know. Talk lesser, thumbs down. <laughs> Is that okay? No, no, you don't like me, just thumbs down. I okay one. I chill one. You want to show you're okay or not? You're not going to fall asleep, right? You want to show you're okay. Oh? Press the controller. Anyone see the aircon controller? Oh, right. <laughs> Thanks. My fault, my fault. Okay. Okay, now we go back to chapter three, uh, atomic structure. Okay, so in your atom, right, there is three things. We have proton, electron, neutron. And then what do you need to know? You have your relative mass and relative charge. Okay, your relative mass of proton will be 1, neutron will also be 1. Electron is very light, it's 1 over 1840 or 1836, both accepted. Okay, relative charge of proton will be plus 1. Electron will be minus one. So means protons are positively charged particles, electrons are negatively charged particles. And your neutron, neutron means neutral zero charge. Right? And the fun thing about chemistry is that in your TYS, this is six marks. Yeah, that's the fun thing about chemistry. TYS on the year, this is six marks. Okay. Right, then what else do we need to know? Okay. So new Neutrons and protons are found inside the nucleus. Okay, so therefore you may see this word called nucleons. Okay, take note, nucleons and neutron is different. Huh? Why are they called nucleons? Because neutrons and protons are inside the nucleus. This is essentially your mass. Right, in your periodic table, you will see like the chemical symbol and a larger number and a smaller number, okay, maybe let's say use carbon, right, this larger number will be your mass, what does it consist of? Proton plus neutron, this is your proton number, or atomic number, so there's two terms for each number, proton number slash atomic number, this one, the larger one is known as nucleon number or mass number, there's two names.
Okay, then another thing to take note, how can you calculate the number of neutrons? Most of you will instinctively just take the large number minus the small number, right? Why is that the case? Because based on math algebra, if you want to calculate n, okay, I think you cannot see, right? Let me move it up. Huh? Based on math algebra, if you want to calculate n, what will you do? You will shift the p over, lah, right? So n equals m minus p. So mass number minus number of protons. That's how you get number of neutrons. Okay, and the last thing about atoms is that atoms are electrically neutral. Okay, I don't think you need to copy this down as long as you understand. Okay, electrically neutral means no overall charge. Why do atoms don't have any charge? It's because they have the same number of protons and electrons. Okay, same number of protons and electrons. This is for atoms only, huh? because later we will look at terms like isotopes and ions. Then you need to know what are the differences between atoms, ions, isotopes. So atom is like your most basic form, where right? everything is like same same. Okay. Right, then let's take a look at the first question. This element got 111 protons and 141 neutrons. How do you write the chemical symbol of that element? Now we kind of choose. How do you write the chemical symbol? It means that I express it like this in this notation. 111 protons, so proton number should be 111, right? Well, where did this 30 even come from? Okay. And then the mass, the mass is 111 plus 141. Yes. Oh. Alright, let's say yeah. Alright, maybe I wrong one. Alright. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mass is 111 plus 141. Okay, giving you 252 as a mass number. Why, why, why? Let's see, I'm not even see you anyway. That's all, that's all. I'm going to say, man. Okay, then this. The nuclear number, don't get confused, this is mass. If you want, you can write. And proton number of an atom of P and Q are shown. Okay, which statement about P and Q is correct? Right, so a hint for you or a tip for you is that if you know the proton number, right, you all can refer to your periodic table and identify what it is. Okay, proton number 35, this should be bromine. 37 is... That's 37. Or rubidium, okay. 37 is rubidium. I write over here lah, rubidium, bromine. If you all don't like dealing with unknowns, okay, now you all know the identity. You only can do this if you know the proton number. Why? Because proton number and number of protons don't change. Okay, so see if this thing helps you or not lah. Right, neutron number is a mass, proton number is 37. Right, then you have a few statements over here, right? What I suggest you to do is you write out all the electrons and neutrons. So maybe, neutrons. Okay, then electrons. How to get neutrons, just take the large number, the mass minus proton number. Quick math, this is 48, I think. Quick plus 8. Plus 8 is 45. 48. Okay, then it's 45. Okay. This is the number of neutrons, huh? just take neutron minus proton. Okay, then what about electrons? These are atoms, right? Atoms mean same number of protons and electrons, so 37. 35. Okay, now you got everything, you just go and find the answer. Lah. An atom of P has fewer electrons. Nope. P got 37. This is wrong. Okay, an atom of P has more neutrons. Yes, this is correct. 48 compared to 45. Okay. For C and D, just now you all identified already, right? This rubidium and bromine. You all can see that they are both in different group and different period. So let's say I use this, right? Bromine is here. 
your rubidium is here. So C and D is out. They are both in different group, different period. Okay. So answer will be B, yeah, this one. Okay. The dynamic below shows the structure of two atoms. Which statement is true about the two atoms? Same thing, you know the number of protons, you can go find out what it is. This is nitrogen, this is phosphorus. Okay, phosphorus has a proton number of 15. Okay, then what are isotopes, right? Isotopes are, they all can write here. They all can expect definition to be tested. Uh, atoms of the same element, or three marking points, uh, with the same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. Can be one mark or two mark, depending on your school. You then some students ask, electrons need or not? No, no need. It's not part of the marking criteria. criteria. So same element, same number of protons, different number of neutrons. So example of isotope will be these two that you will see commonly. Okay, so some of you may be wondering why is chlorine mass number 35.5? Because on Earth, 75% of the chlorine has a mass of 35. 25% of the chlorine has a mass of 37. When you calculate the average mass, right, you will get 35.5. Okay, so that's how the 35.5 comes about. La. It's due to isotopes. Okay, anything else over here? And just to give you a clearer picture, proton, electron, neutron. This is 17, 17, 17, 17. But what about the neutrons? 35 minus 17 is 18. 37 minus 17 is 20. So you can see, uh, same number of protons, different number of neutrons. So this is the first two, atoms versus isotopes. The ions one I will teach later. Okay. Now, are both of them isotopes or not? Whenever you see isotopes, what I recommend is you write the short form. Same P, different N. Why? Because the moment you see the answer, you will get confused and you start to doubt yourself. So before you even look at the answer and get confused, you write this first, get your thoughts straight first. Okay? Okay, so both different number of protons already. So they are not isotopes. In fact, they are different elements, so out. Both of them are metals, no. Nitrogen, phosphorus on the right side, non-metals. Okay. Both atoms belong to the same group. Yes, this will be in your group 15 or group 5. Okay. How do you know they are in the same group? You can see they have the same number of valence electrons. My right? elements in the same group have the same number of valence electrons. In this case, they have 5. Okay. So this is correct. Are they in the same period? No, because they have different number of electron shells. Okay, so what's the key concept over here? Same group, same number of valence electrons. Valence means outer shell. Huh? Same period, same number of electron shells. Any questions up to this point? Oh, okay. Right, then maybe let's look at a few examples. Let's say magnesium, 24, 12, right? If you write the electronic configuration based on this, it will be 2.8.2. Now, this information is very useful. Immediately, you can see that there's two valence electrons. There's also three electron shells, right? Where can you find magnesium in the periodic table? 
is actually in period 3. So hopefully you can see, the period number tells you how many electron shells there are. Okay? The group number actually tells you the number of valence electrons. This mechanism is in group 2. Okay, or for the set 4, it will be like this, group 2. Okay, so that's why I made you write this over here. Same group, same number of valence electron. Same period, same number of electron shells. Right? You all will see this again in one of the future chapters. Okay, atom M has an electronic configuration. 25, atom N285. Which statement about N is correct? You know? Try to interpret this uh, information now. So hopefully you can see N has three shells. Okay, this is actually nitrogen and phosphorus also. La. So you can see how they will tweak and vary the question, but they're actually testing the same thing. Okay, we go and find seven proton number, 15 proton number. Right, so this is true. Three shells. N has more electrons in outer shell? No. They have the same number of electron shells. Are they in the same period? No. They have different number of electron shells. Okay, they have same number of valence electrons, so same group. Okay. Right, then five. Then I'll try. Isotopes. Right, so same thing, just write out before you get confused. Okay, then now the answer should be quite straightforward. Okay, the mass is different by 3 units because there is 3 more additional neutrons. Remember, protons doesn't change. Right, then this one I give you all some time to try. Y'all should be seeing this. Or oh, end of year. Oh, I haven't seen before. This kind of table. I give like five minutes, y'all just try up to she can try everything. Five minutes, huh? Treat this as a test, see how much you get. And so for those of you that want to refer to periodic table, you can because you are given the number of protons. So see, I think most of you at the worksheet, I'll just put periodic table here. Okay. Then you can find. Okay, proton number 7, 8, 10, 11. What are they? Three more minutes. Oh, sorry, we're done. Okay, maybe about one more minute. Lah. Just choosing letters only, right? The phrasing we can go through together.
I go to R. Okay, so seven nitrogen. All your eight is oxygen. Ten is neon. Eleven is sodium. Okay, use proton number to reference up. Uh, cause protons don't change. Which particles are isotopes? Okay, you already see an S over here, so there should be two or more answer lah. But usually isotopes is two only. Okay. Isotopes, same number of protons, different number of neutrons. So these three got same number of protons, but only these two have different number of neutrons. Okay, same number of protons, different number of neutrons. D and D. Okay, same proton, different number of neutrons. Oh yes, then regarding the definition just now, right? A lot of students have to write this. Uh, uh, there's no such thing as neutron number. So if examiners see this, they were minus one mark already. You have to write number of neutrons. There is only proton number. There's no such thing as electron number or neutron number. Okay? So write number of neutrons for definition. Okay, C and D. Um, usually isotopes have same number of electrons as well. Yeah, B and D will be a better answer. Okay, but C in this case should be accepted also. But B and D is still better. Key difference is different number of neutrons. Okay. Okay, then next, explain why isotopes have similar chemical properties. So in chemistry, you need to know how to spot the difference and spot why it's the same. If something is similar, then what thing is the same? That's why they have similar chemical properties. What thing is the same for isotopes? That's why it got similar chemical properties. So you know? See before or not? Okay, isotopes have same number uh, isotopes have. Same number of outer shell electrons also can. Okay, so chemical properties related to number of valence electrons are. Therefore, elements in the same group have similar chemical properties. Okay, then which particle found in third period? Just now you all denoted this sodium, right? So yes, it's F. Then just make sure that you all use the letters that they give. Right, not the actual substance that you wrote. Common careless mistake also. Okay, group 15. Or oh, for the set 4, group 5. This will be your nitrogen, so it should be A. Okay, particle, uh, no S, uh, so only one answer. That's how you tell also. Move up. Okay, state the electronic configuration or sometimes they may use this phase structure. This means they want the two dot something dot something. Okay, particle E is neon, right? So 10. So how do you split 10 electrons up? 2 dot 8. Explain why is it unreactive? Neon is an example of noble gas. So then I say noble gas exists as individual atoms. Why? Okay. Particle E has a stable electronic configuration and does not gain, lose, or share electrons. It's happy already because full shell already. Let me move up so y'all can see.
Jag vet inte hur vi gör detta. Vi stöd the electronic configuration först, then explain. Det är så att jag är med. Och as you explain why it exists as individual atoms. Same thing, okay? Okay, which of these particles is negatively charged? Okay, just compare the number of protons and electrons. Remember, protons are positive charges, electrons are negative charges. You can see that for C, you have 8 positive charge and 10 negative charge. So C is the answer. It has two more electrons at the top, just like that. I think now we are at chemical bonding. Okay, yep. So before that, um, so just now we have atoms and isotopes. Now we look at atoms versus ions. Okay, I don't think you need to copy this. Just understand more important. So let's say you sodium. Huh? Sodium is twenty three eleven, right? How will you split the electrons? Two dot eight dot one. So when you draw, when you move down, two dot eight dot one. Then now you look at the protons, electron, and neutron. Atoms say number of proton, electron, right? So eleven, eleven. How do you get number of neutrons? Twenty three minus eleven. What about ions? Atoms gain or lose electrons to form ions. Okay, so I write over here. So what does that mean? Now your electrons will change. Right? Why do they gain or lose electrons? It's because they want to achieve stable electronic configuration or full outer shell. So what will sodium do right, to achieve a full shell? The most efficient way is to lose one. Electron. Okay, then now you're going to have this. Okay. Since it lost one negative charge, now is yes, a positive charge okay, of one unit. Lose one electron, so now ten. Neutrons still twelve. So you can see the key difference now is the electrons. Protons and neutrons are the same now. Right? So atoms, isotopes, ions, protons always the same. Right? Atoms and isotopes, neutrons different. Okay? Atoms and ions, electrons different. So take note of the differences. Okay? And why do they gain or lose electrons to achieve full shell? Now that you understand the purpose of it, right, then you have this. Okay, you have to copy it. Now, this is a shortcut. I think that's enough to do it. Yeah, this shortcut. Huh? Okay, you all may want to just memorize the charge of the common. Ions. Okay, group one means they have one valence electron, right? Means how do they get pushed out? Lose one lah. So all group one elements will form a plus charge ion. That's why you will see Na plus, K plus, Okay, then your group two 
Maybe two plus. Two outer shell electron will lose two lah. Okay, and then so on so forth. Just imagine like you are going up and come down. So this is minus three minus and minus. Okay, these are the charges of the common ions. That's why you will see like Cl minus, uh, O2 minus. All this is fixed one. Okay, you can just reference to oh, the oh, cannot. Okay, hopefully you can see. Uh, so these are common things that you should have seen when writing chemical formula. Okay, so this is the easy way. Like, just memorize and write at the top if you want. Okay. There is there anything else here? Mm, okay, don't have. Okay, just a quick one for chlorine. What about non-metals? Non-metals, they usually gain electron to get full shell. Okay, let's not use chlorine, use chlorine. Chlorine is 2.7, right? How does it get a full shell? It will gain 1. So this time I don't draw la, I just show you the electronic configuration. Should be enough already. After gain 1 electron, gain 1 negative charge, it will be F minus. Right, so I just write the protons here. Proton 7, electron 7, neutron also. Uh, 19 minus 9, 10. The proton is 7, the electron is 8 now because it gained 1. That's what minus means. Neutron is still 10. So you can see, uh, this is the key difference. Okay, this is for your non metals. Right. And this is the most efficient way. Comparing, gain, comparing losing 7 versus gaining 1, gaining 1 is more efficient. Then let's look at the questions. Uh. Any questions first before we go through? Any okay, right? Okay. All right, for chemical bonding, there is only two types that you need to know. There is ionic and covalent, uh, right? Let's quick summary over here. Ionic, how do you tell? Usually metal, non-metal. Covalent is only non-metal. Okay. I only involve the transfer of electron. So these are our keywords. Covalent involves the sharing of electron. Yeah, I think that's it for this chapter. So, electronic structure of M and N are shown. M and R react to form an ionic compound. Even if they don't tell you this, they kind of expect you to know. Since you have the electronic structure, same thing, you can go and match. This is 2.6, this is actually oxygen. Okay. Then this is 2.8.1, which is sodium. Metal, non metal will give you ionic compound. Okay. So, this is them being very nice. Okay, what is the formula of this compound? Ionic compound, you have ions, right? So remember what are the charges of the common ions? Sodium is in group 1, so you form Na+. Plus. Oxygen is in group 16. Right? How does it get a full shell? It will gain 2 more, so 2 minus. You are not supposed to memorize chemical formula. You are supposed to know the charges of the ions, and then you balance the charge. This will give you this. Okay? 2 minus, you need one more Na plus to like cancel out the effect. 
Therefore, the formula will be N to M. Right. The diagram shows the arrangement of electrons in the outer shells of the atom in compound YZ. You need to recognize that this is a covalent substance. Why? The sharing of electrons involves covalent bonds. Right. Same thing over here. You can go and match with your periodic table. Look at how many outer shell electrons you have. Z has seven crosses. What does that mean? It is in group 17 or group 7. Okay. Z. Trees group 17, set force group BII. Okay, then now you look at Y. Y got six circles. What does that mean? It is group. I don't know, should be lesser. Yeah. Hmm? Okay, thanks, thanks. Group 16. How about 6 outer shell electrons? Wait, group 6. Group 6. Okay. Alright, then you just go and match in your periodic table. Look. So group 17, what is inside there? It is... Okay. Y first, right? So Y is group 16. Only two possible options. Z, what is inside of group 17? Or group 7, chlorine. Okay, which change occurs when magnesium bonds with chlorine? Possible to come as open ended also. There is like kind of two or three steps. The first thing that happens is that magnesium will lose two electrons. So magnesium atom, right, same number of protons and electrons, lose two electrons to get full shell to become Mg2 plus. Then the second step, your chlorine will gain one to form Cl minus. Okay, so open ended like that too much. Magnesium lose two electrons to form Mg2 plus ions. Chlorine atom gain one electron to form Cl minus ions, two marks. Okay. In okay, question four, I let you all try before I teach the shortcut. Potassium chloride is an ionic compound. So, which set of information that best describes it? Of metal, non metal. That's how I know it's ionic. Okay? What do you all know about properties of ionic compounds? You all have an answer in mind? Okay, key concept tested over here. Ionic compounds can only conduct electricity in molten ecostate. This is the key distinctive feature. No other type of substance have this. Okay, only compounds cannot conduct in solid state. Huh? So no, no, no. But molten state can, yes. Then B.
Ionic compounds don't conduct electricity in a solid state. Only metals for combined signs. Yeah. Right, so as you can see, school exams will try to trick students. Yes, ionic compounds have high melting point, but a lot of substances have a high melting point. Right, there's an overlap. It's not conclusive enough. You need to look at the electrical conductivity. There's no overlap for this. The moment you identify this, that is confirmed ionic compound. That's a shortcut. Okay. Open ended, you will see. You are required to explain why. Okay, for this. Okay. Shall I try? Ions. What does the minus mean? What does the plus mean? So same thing, I recommend you to write all the things out first, then you just check your answer. Don't need periodic table since everything given to you here. You can just do slowly, it's fine. These are ions, huh? not atoms. I'll go through one example maybe. Proton number 9. What does minus mean? Minus means gain one electron. So 10. Number of neutrons, mass minus number of protons, 10. Okay, then you'll try for the other side. What does the plus mean? Okay, protons should be 11 for this. Electrons should be 10 because lost 1. Number of neutrons is also 10, 21 minus 11. Okay, then now just check your answer. Lah. Same number of electrons, yes. Same number of protons, no, 9 and 11. Fluoride contains more electrons, no. Sodium ion contains more neutrons, no. Right. Explain why argon tend to exist as individual atoms. Can I remember how to explain? What does noble gases have? Or what do noble gases have? Okay. Anything else? Right. Argon has a stable electronic configuration and is unreactive. Explain why chlorine gas tend to exist as diatomic. Di means two. Right? Visually, it looks like this. So, oxygen gas also exists like this. Right? Just now we saw this kind of diagram. This is diatomic. Individual atoms just now was like this. Right? Okay, why chlorine gas doesn't exist alone? Why do they need to exist as a pair? Okay. H. Chlorine atom will share one valence electron with another chlorine atom to achieve stable electronic configuration. When you can draw the dot and cross, showing the outer shell electrons only. Chlorine got seven outer shell electrons, right? So it will look something like this. Okay, this is the dot and cross for chlorine. Lah. So you can see, each chlorine share one. Now both got full valence shell. They are both happy. Therefore, this.
Okay, next. In terms of bonding and structure, explain why sodium chloride exists as a solid at room temperature. Okay, bonding and structure. So there is some form of template to this. Okay, so tell me about the structure first. In combined size, there is only two. Okay, sodium chloride as a giant ionic lattice structure. Okay, lattice is double P. Okay, giant, right? So how much energy do you think you need? A high amount of energy is needed to overcome the strong okay, electrostatic forces of attraction between the sodium. Okay, let's just make it easier for you. Opposedly charged ions. Then you just conclude. Hence, sodium chloride has a high melting point. If something has a high melting point, then it will exist as a solid. So four points for two marks. Okay, tell me the structure. Tell me how much energy you need. Tell me what are you overcoming. And then tell me the melting point boiling point. Okay, so the good news for combined science is that there's only two. I put two over here. Your school may test two, but confirm one will come out. Okay. Now chlorine gas or maybe oxygen gas. Okay. Chlorine gas has a simple molecular structure. Simple, right? So a low or small amount up to you to overcome the weak intermolecular forces of attraction between the molecules. Then hence, chlorine has a low boiling point. Low boiling point, that's why it's a gas. Okay, if you all want, you can write short form for forces of attraction over here. I know it's quite long. You can write FOA. Okay, forces of attraction. Exam, you just write everything out. Lah. Okay, the key thing that I want to emphasize is the keywords used over here. This question actually has one of the most common misconceptions or misuse of keywords. Take note of this phrasing, okay? Strong, electrostat strong electrostatic FOA. Okay, for ionic compounds. The other one is weak intermolecular FOA. There shouldn't be any mention of covalent bonds at all. I know some of you were right with covalent bonds, then wrong already. Okay? There's only two possible phasing over here. Both is FOA, but is it electrostatic or intermolecular? Okay, do not mention anything about covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are not broken in combined science syllabus. Okay, so for visual illustration, Okay, when you hit all these simple molecular structure substances, 
what you are breaking is the weak intermolecular forces of attraction between the molecules. You are not breaking the covalent bonds. Okay, even though they are covalent substances. Okay, everyone done. Okay, explain why solid ionic compounds cannot conduct electricity. Two marks. In a solid state, the ions are held in fixed position by strong electrostatic forces of attraction. Okay, hence the ions are not mobile and cannot act as charge carriers. But why when motor state or equal state possible? Right? The Electrostatic forces, the FOA, are weaker and the ions are mobile. So, what's the key concept over here, right? For electrical conductivity or for something to conduct electricity, you need to have mobile ions or mobile electrons. But combined science, you won't really see the mobile electrons. This mobile electrons is for your metals. Any compounds, then you use mobile ions. Okay. And these ions and electrons, charged particles, they must be able to move. That's what mobile means. So they can carry electrical charge from one point to another point. That's the logic behind it. Right. Over here, they are fixed position. There are ions, but they cannot move. That's why I cannot conduct electricity for any compounds. Okay, I'll give you the last variation. They'll ask you why chlorine gas cannot conduct electricity at all states. Okay, one of these compounds come out, but they may test both, I don't know. Simply tell me there are no mobile ions or mobile electrons. Okay, to act as charge carriers or to carry electrical charge. One mark for this. Okay, so for this worksheet, right, try to study the keywords. I can't guarantee the same substance will be tested, but the keywords will still be relevant. At least 50% of these questions will come up for your set 3 and of year. Okay, quite confident of that. I've seen like so many papers. Okay, so try to understand and uh, go home and digest. This session will be recorded so long. Uh, you need to revisit. Okay. Then yes. Oh, still copying. Uh. Dot and cross also confirm come out. It's just a matter of one or two. Okay. All right, dot and cross. There's only two kinds, same thing. It's ionic or covalent. Okay, how do you tell whether it's ionic or covalent? This is a metal, non-metal, right? So ionic lah. Ionic involve the transfer of electrons, we will be drawing the bracket one. Okay. 
Okay. If you need, you can write out the electronic configuration. Potassium 19, right? How do you split up? 2, 8, 8, 1. Oxide and oxygen split to 2, 6. Okay. How can these two elements or atoms get a full shell? Potassium will lose one, right? So what do you do? Take note of the instruction also, show outer shell electrons only. Okay, sometimes they require you to draw everything, sometimes they require you to show outer shell electrons only. Okay, K plus. Oxygen, 2, 6, right? What will you do? You get full shell, you will gain 2. Okay, so few singly first. Your teacher probably say north, south, east, west, clockwise, anti-clockwise, doesn't matter. Few singly first. Okay. 6 already, right? Then it needs 2 more. This one, I'll... Hey, wait, sorry. You circle. Different symbol. Few singly first, huh? Okay, then one X come here, one X come here. It gained two electrons, so two minus. Okay, then what you do next, the last step is just to balance the charge. Same as how you write chemical formula. This is plus, this is two minus, right? I will need two of this. So you just write two in front. Your school may make you draw two, that's also fine. But just be careful for this. Remember, use different symbols. Okay, don't everything circle. Common mistake. Okay. In case you want the chemical formula is K2. Sometimes it's given to you, sometimes it's not. That's why you got 2K over here. Okay. Right, then I will end off with one last one. All well done, right? Okay, covalent one. How do you know it's covalent? You see non-metals inside here, only. there's chlorine, there is oxygen. Di means two, okay? Mono means one actually. So this thing is actually Cl2O. But this one, they should give you the chemical formula exam because it's a bit more rare, okay? So there's only one oxygen, right? So make oxygen the center. Usually for your covalent uh, substances, it's symmetrical. Okay, so I just draw the circles first. This covalent, so it's the sharing one. Huh? Then what you do, work from outside, go to the center. If you start from the center, you need to consider three atoms. Very complicated. Right? So start from one of the corners, maybe this side. Make chlorine happy first. How do you make chlorine happy? If you want, you can write this again. 2.8.7. This is 2.6. Chlorine need one more. So in general, it will share one. Okay, so share one first. Okay, then just fill up. Okay, now this chlorine is happy. Then you go to the other side. Usually it's symmetrical. Okay. Okay, then like this. Okay, now both chlorine happy, then you look at the center. This is the last one to consider already. Okay. Oxygen got six on its own. By right, I used two already. Okay, two circles here, right? How many more to draw? Four. So one, two, three, four. Okay, so after you draw your dot and cross, just two things to check. If you fulfill these two criteria, you should be correct. Uh, all atoms and ions, full shell. All electrons are paired. For both ionic and covalent, uh, you satisfy these two rules, you should be correct already. No electrons should be left alone like, like this. Okay? Okay, then the last one I will just show you okay, 2.4, sulfur is 2.8.6 Okay, this is non-metal, non-metal as well, this is the last one already, hang in there ah. This is actually a variation of your carbon dioxide okay. They just changed the O to S 
So if you look at sulfur, it needs two more. So in general, it will share two. So it means two pair over here. Okay. Use four already. How many more to draw for sulfur? Sulfur, a four. So like this, like this, like this, like this. Okay, then now we go to the other side. Should be symmetrical. Okay, like this, like this, like this, like this. Okay, then you check your carbon. Okay, push out already, happy. Okay, done. That's it. Alright, yeah, that's it for the worksheet part. Okay, so hopefully this revision session is okay for you. I'm not at my best. I'm, I apologize for that. Okay, this is the... What's going to happen in the next few months? La. Right, so just take note of October, the free trial lessons registration will be open by then because of limited slot. Okay, so just take note when it's released. Similar to this physical slots thing. Okay? Uh, the actual free trial lessons will be in early November. The actual group tuition will start around November mid or late or December. And not every week will have lessons because I need the rest also. This is just FYI. If you all have any feedback, you all can scan the QR code as well. Need longer session, talk lesser, more materials, more notes. You all can put over here, right? Why, right, Bonnie? Why? Right. Okay. All right. If not, that's all. Thanks for attending. Uh, yeah. Finish students, we will resume at maybe four ten, and we take a break first, uh. Okay, if not, that's all. Anyone need the revision kit or goodie bag? Can let me know, okay? Yeah. Answers uploaded on Friday if you all need. Yeah. Okay, see you. Thanks. Bye bye. Yeah, I can leave it then, no way. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Okay, for physics students, I will recreate the room, okay? So I will leave first and then come back. Welcome, bye bye. Bye bye. Hmm? Go back, go back already. Then, can pull out MCQ now. No man, but you but that's probably not. Oh, was it hard? Maybe these answers are practical, like, 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 practical,